chapter 9, uh, verse 1 says this, And as Jesus passed by, He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And His disciples asked Him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind with the clay. And he said, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, by interpretation, sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came again seeing. Now, lots of interesting things are going on in this passage. First of all, the bottom line is, he had his sight restored to him. Jesus restored his sight. And before we say anything else, Jesus said in this passage, I uh, must work the works of him that sent me. And the bottom line of it, before we start looking at what other things he said, the bottom line is when Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me, and the man came again with his sight restored, evidently then God who sent him, the plan was, or the work of work the work that Jesus was to work was to restore his sight. Now, uh, sometimes I say that because if you if you read it casually, you might get the idea that God made him blind just so Jesus would have something to do, like uh, pitch him a softball, you know. <laughs> you know, just set it up so Jesus would have something to show how great he was. But, uh, but that I don't think that's the case. I don't think you can say that because Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me, and the work that he did was to take away the blindness. So if a person is going to argue God made him blind, then you have to also say, well, Jesus by working the works of God and undoing it, it's like that cross-purposes. And I don't think Jesus is working at cross-purposes. That's one observation, that uh, God didn't make Him blind. You know, there's enough bad going on in the world that we don't have to attribute any of it to God. Uh, there's enough bad uh, without blaming it on God. But I, I understand why people casually read this and get that, but that really is not what He's saying. But the main thing I want to get at is, back in verse 2, the disciples asked him, here was a man that was born blind, and the disciples said, listen to the first thing they say. Oh, I know what's wrong. I didn't put this on. That'll help. <laughs> oh, boy, sorry about that. I wonder how that's going to sound. Okay. Oh, they found the man born blind, and the first thing that crosses the disciples' mind is not, what can we do for him? How can we help him? Uh, the first thing that crosses their mind is, who sinned? And then they start thinking, well, maybe this man, or maybe it was his parents. In other words, they're trying to figure out why it happened. They're trying to fix blame for it. And when Jesus answered them, He didn't really directly answer their question. He said in verse 3, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Now, He's not saying in that that this man and his parents are sinless, we know that's not the case because uh, we're told in the Psalms, and Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 3, that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Jesus isn't saying that the man had never committed a sin because like every human being, he was imperfect and had sins of his own and likewise his parents. What Jesus is saying when He says, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, He's saying uh, it has nothing to do with it. He's not denying that he sinned, but he's saying there is no connection. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's born blind. Now, this is a radical uh, idea and a radical doctrine because you, if you read in the Old Testament, uh, especially in, in Deuteronomy and in the Law, you can find that there is, there definitely is retribution for sin. But now that Jesus is on the scene, he is saying uh, no retribution. Uh, but in fact, I'm going to work the works of Him that sent me, and the one that sent me sent me to, to undo it and to make it right again. Now, we've got to recognize that when Jesus comes into the world, it makes a tremendous difference. And I think uh, we cannot overemphasize that enough. The fact that, and, and the way I like to put it and explain it or uh, draw it to people's attention is to say if you hold your Bible in your hands and look at it, you see that your Bible is divided into old and new. There's a big... Uh, it, a big, uh, what do I want to say, definite 
division. And that tells us that there is a difference. There is something different between old and new. And the difference is Jesus. The new starts with Jesus arriving on the scene. The new covenant, uh, the idea of a new covenant or a new testament, the idea of that was introduced by Jesus Himself at the Last Supper when He said, this cup is My blood. This cup is My blood of the new covenant. He initiated or brought it into reality. And so the fact that there is a difference, if we read in, in Hebrews in chapter 8, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, the very last verse says, the very fact, the very fact that he says, and he prophesied it in Jeremiah, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of, house of Jacob. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers when I led them by the hand, brought them out of the, uh, the land of Egypt, because uh, they did not observe my covenant, so I did not observe them. Uh, he, that's quoted in the book of Hebrews, and he says, he, the point is, the very fact that God says, I will make a new covenant, makes the first one old, or makes it obsolete. Uh, I know that uh, that makes some people uncomfortable, but, but we need to recognize that there, there is a new way of relating to God. There is a new um, truth, a new um, way of seeing God. And the way that Jesus is introducing Him here is not a God of retribution, but a God of restoration, a God of reconciliation, a God of making things right again. Now, this is... So important a point that I don't want to skip over this. When the, the disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents, Jesus could have said, well, they both did, and you did too. <laughs> you know, everybody but me. <laughs> he could have said that. that. And that would have been true for him to say that. But when he says in verse 3, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, what he's really saying is it has nothing to do with it. You, all, you're thinking of fixing blame and... Uh, and I think people do that because it makes them feel, if we can look around and see someone else getting what's coming to them, we somehow feel safe because it got them and so it's not going to get us. Uh, that's a weird kind of uh, lo but, uh, logic, but, and it's not really logic at all. Uh, I think the message translation makes it even more plain and even more direct. If you'd, uh, Anton, give me the message, starting with verse 1. Back, let's go back to verse 1. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. All right, verse 2. His disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents causing him to be born blind? So far the same thing we had in King James. Now listen to how the message says in verse 3. Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. See, the wrong question is, what? You're looking for someone to blame. You're trying to fix blame. Now I think that's very profound that uh, Eugene Peterson translated it this way in the message because that is exactly what's be the thought that's being conveyed. You are looking for someone to blame. There's no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. Now what he's getting at is God didn't do this. Now let's look for what God can do. But the main thing, the main thought is, don't fix blame. You're looking for someone to blame. That's what he's, he's uh, pointing out to them. We don't need to look for and we shouldn't be looking for someone to blame. Now this has application in two ways. First of all, it has, and this is important, it, you should apply this to your own life. This has application in your own life, and then it has application to everybody other than you, everybody else. Uh, the point is, God is not playing the blame game anymore. Now, that's just another way of saying the fundamental truth that we hold as Christians, the fundamental fact, that's why, you know, the reason Christians wear crosses and put crosses up on the wall, and I've got some in the back there. Why do we have the cross as an important emblem? Because on the cross, Jesus, we believe, and, and it's true, as, as of the fundamental fact of Christianity, Jesus carried our sins in His own body on the tree. That means the blame or the punishment or the judgment, however you want to say it, for our sins was carried not by the one who sinned, which was you and me, but by the one who didn't sin, Jesus. The blame and the punishment and the retribution all fell not on the one who deserved it, but the one who didn't deserve it. The one who had no sin took the sins of those who did, so that those who had sinned and would be disqualified would now be qualified to stand before God as though sin never existed. That's how fully He took that. Now, this is a radical, and, and I want to point it out, and I don't want to smooth over it, a radical departure from the rules of the game in the Old Testament, in which it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and the way Ezekiel says it is, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
And the one who sins gets stoned with stones. And it was personal sin gets personal payment, personal judgment. In the New Testament, we don't have it that way. Everybody's sin gets paid for by one man. By one man's sin, uh, we're all made righteous. Or by one man's payment for the sin. Our sins are paid for by Jesus. By one man's death, sin is paid for. The Lamb of God took away the sin of the world. Uh, instead of one man's sin gets one man's punishment, one man, Jesus, who had no sin, takes the punishment of all the world. So now, what that means is, Jesus uh, has a new message to preach and He's preaching it to them. Notice again, you're looking for someone to blame. What's wrong with that? Well, we're, the blame's going to fall on Jesus when He goes to the cross. And so now Jesus is freely giving away the results of nobody has to... See, it's not that this man didn't sin. It's not that it might not have been right for him to uh, have some kind of retribution for his sins. It's not that that might not have been just. But Jesus is saying don't, the blame doesn't fall on the individuals anymore. I'm going to take the blame. Now before we look at this a little um, more um, uh, in the theory or the, uh, let's see, the doctrine of it, let's look at some more examples of it first. Here's a good one in uh, Luke's Gospel. If you go back there for a moment. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. I just want to point out the, the, the reality of what Jesus is saying and illustrating, and then we will talk about uh, the way Paul explains it. See, Paul gives us the doctrine, uh, but Jesus gives us the examples. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, and I want to begin reading with verse uh, 51. This is quite a long chapter when you have 50... Uh, it's got 62 verses in the whole chapter. Okay. Verse 51. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now, the Samaritans did not receive him, because he let it be known that he was on the way to Jerusalem. And there was some animosity and jealousy between Samaritans and uh, the Jews about where you worshipped. You can read that in, you know, when Jesus is at the well of Samaria in John chapter 4. The woman at the well says, well, our forefathers worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews say you should worship in Jerusalem. There was a doctrinal division. And as is the case with many such doctrinal divisions, they hated each other about it. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that funny? I mean, I... Maybe you don't think it's funny. I think it's a little bit amusing. Uh, the kind of hatred that exists even among Christians over, over small and even, uh, let's say, trivial, trivial doctrinal distinctions. I, uh, I was speaking one time, not here, but somewhere else, and uh, I was talking about the subject of holiness. And the point I was making was we're made holy uh, because of Jesus and His holiness. Uh, but it, to illustrate, um, you know, to try to make a distinction, I was talking about something I'd read in a book that I had. I have a book uh, in the office about denominations in the United States. And it's interesting to me because uh, I like to read about all the different ways denominations have formed and divided up and split up all over all, what kind of issues they divided up over. And this one I thought I thought was kind of funny. It made me laugh when I read it, so I was just telling this with the idea in mind that it was an amusing illustration of the point. And it was and I forget even the name of which denomination it was, but they had very similar names. But in the book it said they divided over the necktie issue. <laughs> And it didn't explain which way was supposed to be holy, whether to wear neckties or not to wear neckties. And I made the point that, you know, isn't this silly? Here's the denomination that split in form two over something as trivial as whether you wear a necktie or not. And, um, and I, I made mention of the fact that I, it didn't tell in my book which one was the holy one. You know, and that, on that particular occasion, I had a necktie on. So I presumed that I must be holy because, you know, where I went to school, they said, don't ever get up and preach unless you have a coat and a tie on. Well, look at this. I've... I'm breaking all the rules today. I don't have a coat or a tie. It's a nice sweater anyway. At least I did that. Okay, <laughs> Give me credit for that. But uh, Anyway, uh, a woman came up after the, the service was over, and she was not laughing about it at all. She grew up in uh, either one of these denominations or an associated one. She knew all about the necktie issue. She told me about it. She, and she wasn't laughing. She didn't think it was trivial at all. She said, well, uh, the, the issue is this. The, the, the idea was to wear neckties meant you were worldly because businessmen in the world wear neckties. And so if you're going to be holy, then you didn't wear a necktie. You had an open-collar shirt. So the, 
if the more holy group or the ones who saw themselves, and she wasn't laughing about it. I, I still wanted to just laugh in her face when she told me that. You're kidding me. That's what I wanted to say. You have got to be kidding. That's such a, you know, that's such a trivial thing. But anyway, the Samaritans hated the Jews, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. The primary issue was it, go, it went back hundreds of years, uh, maybe you know, it went back to the, the uh, after Solomon, after Solomon's uh, son came to power, the uh, kingdom split. Uh, ten tribes in the north and, and uh, two, Judah and Benjamin in the south. And they had Jerusalem, and that's where God's temple was, but in the north they, were, uh, they formed their own, they made their own temple. And so the Samaritans hated the Jews over this issue of where you worshipped God. Now, it doesn't seem like that should be the way it is, but, but it was. So when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, they said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, and this is my paraphrase, he said, all right for you, you're going to Jerusalem, we just won't receive you. And I don't know if that means they wouldn't let him come into their house, they just gave him a cold shoulder. They didn't treat them very nicely. Well, now, I'm just going to ask you, before I read the next verse, how do you suppose the disciples of Jesus felt about that? How do you suppose they, that impressed them when the Samaritans did not receive them as they passed through. Well, let's find out. Verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, listen to this, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias, that's Elijah, even as Elijah did? Now, they're quoting, they're quoting from the Old Testament. They are quoting from a passage from 1 Kings, or no, 2 Kings, chapter 1 of 2 Kings, in which Elijah really did call down fire from heaven. And, and it was a, uh, there was a king that uh, sent messengers to Beelzebub to see if he'd recover or not, and, uh, and Elijah stopped the messengers and said, go back and tell your master it's because there's no God in Israel. That's why he has to send messengers to Beelzebub. And uh, they went back to the king, and that made him mad, so he sent 50 soldiers to basically arrest Elijah. And when the 50 soldiers came, Elijah said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume these 50. And guess what? Fire came down from heaven and consumed those 50. God sent it down. It doesn't say the devil did. It said God did. God sent the fire down and consumed them. Now you might say, wow, why did God send down fire and consume them? Well, the answer is they had it coming, just like everybody did. Everybody should, should get what's coming to them. <laughs> See, when there's no Savior, listen, when there's no Savior, when there's nobody else to bear our sins, then there is no other choice than people. It's just the pure mercy of God that everybody didn't get fire down from heaven on their heads. You see? Because everybody is flawed. Everybody has sinned. And if they're going to get what's coming to them, then God's going to you know, have to judge them individually. Their individual sin requires individual retribution or blame. And the disciples were making a right we might say, application to their mind, except they didn't take one thing into account. That is, when Jesus has come on the scene, there's a new system. There's a new way of relating to God. There's no more fire coming down from heaven. There's no more judgment coming down on individuals. Because Jesus has come to bear the sin of many. Jesus has come to bear the sins of all mankind, to take the blame and the retribution and the judgment upon Himself. He came to do that. You know, He said uh, in the last chapter that we read, uh, I must work the works of Him that sent me. God sent Him for a, a specific purpose. And at the end, He fulfilled it completely by going to the cross and carrying our sins in His own body on the tree. So He can't do anything other than... See, what, he's, what Jesus is doing... Let's go ahead and read it, then I'll tell you why. Uh, verse 55. Jesus didn't like their application of the Scripture here. He turned and rebuked them. He didn't say, good job, guys, for quoting the Scripture. He rebuked them. And he said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Not come to destroy, but to save. Now, it's not that people don't deserve retribution. It's not that they don't deserve judgment. It's not that people don't deserve to be punished. Because as individuals, that everybody does. You know, um, this is why it's important to sometimes, uh, on a regular basis, talk about the things that, that, that I'm bringing up right now. Because everybody, whether we like to recognize it or not, every single person alive has to deal with this, this idea of guilt. Because everybody's guilty, to some degree or other. And even the smallest degree of a sense of guilt will cause you to alienate yourself from God or to separate yourself or to feel disqualified unless you can keep forefront in your mind that there has been a Savior named Jesus who has come and carried away all of my guilt. And so I stand before God guiltless, not because I never did anything wrong, but because Jesus as a Savior has taken all of my guilt. 
Now that's the personal application. Then the secondary application is you need to apply that to everybody around you too. <laughs> They're not to blame either. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, people need to be set free from this blame, this sense of blame that they, you know, it can drive people crazy. I, I've been reading a book by a, a psychologist and he said in his book that most people, when he first started in this profession, he began to realize that most of the people who were coming to him were coming to him because they had a guilty conscience. And he thought to himself, first thought that occurred to him is you should be going to the, you should be going to the theologian instead of to me. But then as he talked to them, he realized they were coming from the theologian. <laughs> the, the theologian, the minister, did not give them deliverance from their guilt. In fact, one person said to him, so I'm coming to you because I'm afraid if I go to the minister, he will make moral judgments about my life. Now, we can understand that, can't we? What's wrong with that? Jesus said, you're, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. We're not supposed to look for the blame. You know? We're supposed to be setting people free from the blame. And ourselves too. Now Jesus said, um, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. All they did was quote from the Old Testament. Right? Right? Am I right? Yeah. So wh why is it that what was right under the Old Testament is not right and proper because there's a change has come? You know, really, I don't think we can say it strongly enough. It's as though the whole spiritual world turned upside down, inside out, and inverted itself. And now blame is not going on individuals. See, this is why it's easy for me to say when people say, when some tragedy happens and they say, well, God did it, God's judging America. It's easy for me to stand up immediately. No, He's not. He's not judging America and He's not judging you and me and He's not judging your neighbor either because all that judgment fell on Jesus. And what God wants people to know is that, that He's already put that judgment on Jesus. So people can come to Him and be free from it. Amen. And be free and stand up and, and, and live life uh, with, and walk with God freely. Not be afraid. Okay, I think it's easy to see that in this passage. The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Let's say another word instead of save. I like save is fine, but let's say rescue. He's come to rescue. I like that word. Rescue us. Uh, rescue from what? Oh, well, from everything. And one thing right here that I'm talking about today, rescue us from that sea of blame and, and retribution and, and guilt and disqualification. He rescues us from that. Let's read one more before we... Uh, Go to Paul. Let's go back to John's Gospel. I guess I should have done this when I was over at John before. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Here's another good story. Account of something that happened in the life of Jesus. And he illustrates the same point. He's not playing the blame game. Verse 1. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again to the temple, and all the people came unto Him, and He sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. I guess what they thought was he would say, uh, contradict Moses, and they could accuse him of that. But it's very interesting what Jesus, how he reacts to that. You see, by the way, it's not that this woman was not guilty. It's not that she wasn't guilty. There's nothing in the text to indicate that what they said was not true and that she wasn't legitimately guilty. And, there's not, and, and it's not that Moses, that they're misquoting Moses because they, they're quoting him just right. Uh, Moses commands us in the law that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. This a little bit reminds me of when the disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus didn't really respond to what they said. He said, well, neither him or his parents, but I've got to work the works of God. He didn't want to even go there and, dis and discuss that. So he stooped down and wrote with his finger on the ground as though he heard them not. It's almost as though he doesn't want to hear accusations. <laughs> Gives me that impression. Like he's not interested in hearing, he did this and they did that. It almost gives me that impression he doesn't want to hear these accusations. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, He that's without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. As though he doesn't want to uh, engage in this game they're playing, the blame game. Verse 9. 
And they which heard it being convicted of their own conscience. Very interesting the way that says that. Um, they which heard it being convicted of their own conscience. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Do you understand what that says? They brought to him someone who was guilty. And Jesus refused to pass judgment on her. In fact, he said, whoever is without sin among you, he turned it back on them and said, you that are without sin. And as they began to look at their own lives, they realized uh, what this means. They realized I'm just as guilty as she is. Maybe I didn't do exactly what she did, but I am in the same boat, in other words. I can't throw a stone at her because I deserve to have thrown stones thrown at me too. So they, being convicted of their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman in the midst. All those uh, who couldn't cast a stone because they had sin just like her. You know, the only one who was qualified to cast a stone at her was Jesus. When He said, He that's without sin, let him first cast a stone. He's without sin. But you notice the one that is qualified to execute judgment refuses to do it. That's an interesting thing. And when Jesus had lifted Himself up he saw and saw none but the woman, He said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, the church world is very good on the last half of what he said. Go and sin no more. Very good about preaching against sin. But see, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to, to preach a message of don't sin unless you first preach the message of uh, there's no condemnation. Neither do I condemn thee. So you've got to have that first. That's got to be there first. He's not condemning you. See, the, that element uh, makes you free to live a, a better life. You see, neither do I condemn thee. That, that's what we need to know and everybody needs to know. He's not condemning you. He's not mad at you. I've had people call me up, you know, uh, like this man I was telling you about, with a guilty conscience about some things. And, you know, and it's not that it wasn't true and it's not that they you know, weren't legitimately guilty. And what I always do, and what I always say after, they're, after they sputter to a halt and <laughs> stop telling me all the, you know, all the, all the bad things uh, that they've done and all the things they feel guilty about, the good news that I have to give to people that, that call me up and tell me that is I have good news for you. God's not mad at you. He's not condemning you. Now, they feel condemned, but it's not God that's condemning. They feel condemned by their own conscience. And, you know, uh, it's a true thing. It's a real thing. Our own conscience convicts us but you see, we have to bring to our conscience uh, the, the reminder that Jesus has already stepped in. He's already stepped into this human situation. Uh, you know, there's an interesting thing I read in, just now in this that I just now brought to my attention, just now I thought of it. Uh, in this, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You notice that he interacted with the ground. He's, and in that story of the blind man, in order to set him, he made he spit on the ground and made clay of the spill. It's almost like uh, like the one who comes from heaven, Jesus. He's he he is down here to interact with with humanity. He's not standing off at a distance making pronouncements. He is mixing uh, what comes out of him, the, the the life that's out of him. He mixes it with the uh, humanity, and he wants to. Uh, he does that to touch us, you see, and to make it real. It's not enough that it's just sort of an abstract concept. He wants it to be real for us. Okay, I think we can see it in these three uh, illustrations. Look at uh, Romans chapter 4 for just a second. God's not playing the blame game. That's the point. He's not interested in retribution. Really, if you let that sink in on your mind, that is such a liberating thought. It changes so much uh, about what people assume about God. And the application is first... He's not interested in retribution where you as an individual are concerned. And secondarily, He's not interested in bringing retribution on anybody else around you. That's, that's just so you... One, you can tell them that if you want. And number two, so you won't be trying to be God's agent and, and punish people. We're bad about that, you know. We want to punish people on, on God's behalf. That person's done something wrong and I know about it, so I'm going to make sure that I'm not very nice to them. That's not really what it's going to help people. Um, okay, Romans chapter 4. Here's an interesting uh, thought Paul conveys to us. Verse 13, he's talking about Abraham in chapter 4. And what is it that he's saying, before I read this, about Abraham in chapter 4? Well, he's saying that Abraham was counted to be righteous before God, not because 
he as an individual was perfectly sin-free and righteous. It says he was, it was counted to him for righteousness because he believed God. Abraham believed God and it was counted or reckoned or attributed to him as righteousness because he did nothing more than believe God. And the point is that same thing is true of us because we believe in Christ. We're made right with God not because we did everything right, but because uh, we're believing in the One who is already right by nature. Amen. So, he's saying in verse 13, uh, trying to illustrate this point, and he points up something uh, interesting. For the promise that he, that is Abraham, should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. I mean, that means empty. But, and the promise made none of, of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there's no transgression. Now, he's saying that um, the promise that God made to Abraham didn't come to him because of the law. In fact, Abraham lived before the law. There wasn't any law when Abraham interacted with God. There was no law to keep. So he says it wasn't through the law, but it was through nothing more than faith. Nothing more than the fact that he believed God. Or let's say it another way, he trusted. Or he relied upon God. Or he put all of his confidence in God. And then he says, verse 14, if it's true that the promises are coming to those, if the promises are made, are, uh, let's see, are acquired by keeping the law, then faith is made pointless. Or faith is made void, he says. It, it's made of none effect. In other words, faith doesn't enter into it. In other words, if you get the blessings by doing everything right, then there's faith doesn't have any part to play. That's what he's saying. But here's why it can't be that way. This is very interesting logic on Paul's part. Here's why he says it can't be that way. Verse 14. Because the law works wrath. Another translation makes this a little more plain. Uh, it says the law produces nothing but retribution. The law produces retribution. So... Uh, if the law, let's say another way, the law disqualifies everyone. So, uh, what, uh, what's the point then? Well, God doesn't want to bring retribution. You know, it, we're all disqualified because we fall short in and of ourselves, but let's factor Jesus into the equation. And remember that Jesus came to make it right, to qualify us with His righteousness and to take on Himself all of our unrighteousness. You see? So we relate to God. How do we relate to God today? based on our faith in Christ. And that's all. Now, it's not that uh, we, we say, wow, uh, I'm made right with God because of my faith in Christ, and let's see how bad I can be. It's nothing like that at all. We want to walk in the light of it and enjoy the, the benefits and the privileges of it. You know, Jesus has brought us into... We sang it this morning, I'm a new creation. Jesus has brought us into a new creation. We are walking uh, around as Christians relating to God in, in, a, in a way that Jesus has brought us into that really does qualify as being called a new creation. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I was just quoting it to you. Let's read it. Verse 17 says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... And there it's, it means any person. Any person be in Christ. He means man in the generic sense of mankind. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature... The margin says creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, when we were singing that this morning, the thought crossed my mind. He doesn't say in this passage, because you're a Christian, you need to get rid of old things and, and produce some new things. He just says they are past, the old things are passed away and everything has been made new. Uh, he's not telling you to do anything about it. He's just saying, here's what's true. This is now true. And again, why is this in the Bible? It's there for you to embrace it and believe it's true. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, any person... I guess I should talk about that for a minute. What does it mean to be in Christ? It's an interesting expression. Uh, here's what the uh, New English Bible says. When anyone is united to Christ. That's what it means. Well, how does a person get united to Christ? It's a good thought, isn't it? How do you get united to Christ? He's not walking around here in a physical body where we can walk up to Him and grab a hold of Him. <laughs> right? So how do we get united to Christ? How do we get to be in Christ if it means to be united to Christ? Well, um, we do it the same way. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been to a wedding 
tomorrow's Valentine's Day. We can think about that. Uh, I've performed some some wedding ceremonies, and you know, basically what happens in a wedding ceremony is uh, two individuals, two separate individuals, walk in before the minister, and they take each other. Basically, that's what happens. The man says, I take you, and the woman says, I take you. Isn't that right? And they walk out. The minister then says, What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They walk in as two separate individuals, but they walk out in the eyes of God joined together. And all they did was take each other with their words. I take you. Did you know that's how a person gets united to Christ? The very same way. I take you as my Lord and as my Savior. And you know what? When you receive Him, He receives you. When you take Him, He takes you. Listen, it's His idea. We don't have to doubt about His part. That's how a person gets to be in Christ. Now, it's not a matter of uh, I've done everything perfectly in my life because nobody has. Everybody is flawed. Everybody is disqualified. But you know, the very thing that the Pharisees accused Jesus of is what's true. They said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. (laughs) This man receives sinners. And yes, he does receive sinners. We come to Him as the sinners that we are, and He receives us. And then, after having received us, there's a change in our life. It's just like, again, to talk about the marriage analogy. If a woman and a man get married, uh, generally speaking, she goes to live with him, and she's got his last name. She's, you could say, a new person. She has a new name, right? And let's just say, let's make an extreme example. Let's just say a kingly person, let's say a prince, has gone down into the town and married a peasant, now she goes to live with him. She's got a lot of things she didn't have before. Everything that's hers is uh, everything that's his is now hers. She's got a whole closet full of new clothes she didn't uh, never had before because he has provided for her. Same thing with Christ. See, there's a new reality because we're united to Christ. Here he explains it. Therefore, if any person be united to Christ, he is a new creature. First thing is, old things, the old life has passed away. This is so different than what we think Christianity is. See, what we think Christianity is is to get up and harangue the people sitting in the pews. You better straighten up and fly right. You better turn over a new leaf or God's going to get you for that. You know, That's what most people expect to hear. In fact, if they don't hear that, they feel uncomfortable. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, a guy, uh, last Sunday night, as you know, I go to BJCC and have a church service on Sunday nights at the prison. Last Sunday night, a guy came to our church service that had never been there. I guess he was new there and he'd never come before. And, and he came up afterwards and he said, this is, I've never heard anything like this before. And he was doubtful, you know. He said, are, are, are you a minister? What, what's wrong? You know, because he wanted to hear, You're, you rotten thing, you, you better straighten up, you better fix things up, and they could go out and feel bad and say it was great service. Uh, that's the way that works. The worse you feel, the better the service. Um, this is so radical because Paul does not say here, listen people, if you want Christ to approve of you, you better get some things out of your life and you better get some new things going on. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things, am I reading that right? Are passed away. They're gone. Now what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to see it that way. Old things have passed away, are passed away, and everything has become new. All things are become new. The next verse, put the next verse up just for a second. Paul didn't write this in verses. Look at the first words. And all things are of God. Okay, now go back again. I'm going to read that in a minute. All things are of God. You know what he's talking about? Go back to verse 17. It means God did all these things. That's what he means. The fact that you're a new creature, old things have passed away, everything's been made new. The next verse says, and all things are of God. I mean, God did it all. All you did was say to Jesus, I take you. (laughs) Yeah. And God did it all. Here's another translation I started to read. When anyone is united to Christ, there is a new world. The old order is gone. A new order has already begun. That's what I'm talking about. We're in a new order of things. We're not in that Old Testament world of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and God's going to get you for that. And, you know, because you've done some things wrong, a retribution is going to fall on you. It's not that way anymore. All your retribution fell on Jesus, and you haven't got any coming. Now, it's not that bad things don't happen in our lives, it's not that if I do something dumb, I might not get a dumb result. You know, it's not that if I go out here and see, if I, this is the example I use, because I, I, you know, if I go out here and run through the stop sign, it's not that the patrolman won't stop and give me a ticket, you know. It's not that at all. But I need to understand that in the divine court of justice where it really matters, with God, there's no retribution coming to me from God. When the highway patrolman stops me for running through the stop sign, it's not God sent him to do that. It's 
my own dumb fault. See, But God's not out there pouring out retribution and judgment and condemnation on people and on me or you. Okay, now the next verse says, see, this is a new world. He's describing to us this new order. All things are of God. Next verse. Who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. That's good to know that He has reconciled us. He did it. You know, by the way, we're powerless to have done that. He did it. You know what it means to reconcile? You ever reconciled your checkbook? Do we still use that language? Does, does anybody do that anymore? See, when I first got my checkbook, they gave me that, and they said, okay, now, when you write a check, you write it down here in this register, how much the check was and who it was for, and then when that thing comes to the bank, that bank statement, you sit down with the bank statement here and your register here, and then you, you compare them and make sure they all they come out right. Right? That's called reconciling. Isn't that right? Now, if there's anything that's, that's if there's any discrepancy, guess who's right and guess who's wrong, probably. Probably they're right and I'm wrong. I've probably made a math mistake. But generally, when I've done that, I've found some things wrong. I've made some mistakes. I'm prone to that in that checkbook. I'm not very good at math sometimes, you know, and I can't always find the calculator. And then I have to get these glasses to even read what I'm writing. And if I don't have that, I make a seven, I think it's a one. I make all kinds of mistakes, right? I'm flawed. I'm a human being. I make a lot of mistakes. My register, see, my register of my, let's just say of my life, my financial life, has a lot of errors in it. And when that one comes from the bank, I've got to somehow make them match. See, and that's called reconciling. When, when they match perfectly, now they're said to be reconciled, right? Now, the way I'm saying it that way is so that you get the idea that in our human lives, we have a lot of things in our human lives where there are flaws and mistakes and we're not exactly in balance with the divine standard. Now, like the checkbook, I've got to sit down and make it, make it match. But with God, notice that it says, uh, He hath reconciled us to Himself. It's like He said, oh, you're never going to get it done. Let me do it for you. <laughs> he did the reconciling through Jesus. He brought us into harmony where we balance. And He says, now you match. You balance. You're reconciled with Me. And you didn't do it. He wants us to know that. You didn't do it. I did it for you. Isn't that good? So there's no discrepancy. We don't have to be afraid. He's, he's reconciled us to Himself. Notice that it first says He's reconciled us to Himself. So you need to know it first. But notice the next thing He says is, and He hath given to us. Who's us? The same us that got reconciled. He's given to us the same us that are reconciled. A ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? The same truth that's true for you. He says this is what other people also need to know. Not that you rotten thing, you better straighten up or God's going to get you for that. But God, the same truth, has reconciled us. And this ministry of reconciliation, well, just in case you don't know, look at the next verse, verse 19. To wit. Now, we don't say that anymore. That's King James language. To wit means this is it. Or namely, this is it. That's not language we use, but that's what it means. In other words, he's saying, the ministry of reconciliation here, now I will explain it to you. To wit. Here it is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Those are some pretty important words. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's why when the disciples said to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, Jesus said, you're, looking, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There's a new order of things now. God's not in the blame game anymore. He's not making people blind. He's not giving people diseases. He's not giving people car wrecks. He's not judging people for their sins because I, Je I'm paraphrasing, I, Jesus, have come to carry all their sins. And now he says, here's this ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. Think about that for a minute. Think about what we mean by the world. Now see, we feel pretty good about ourselves because we're here on Sunday morning where we're supposed to be and you know, we're dressed nice and we feel pretty good. But think about the world out there. See, the world means everybody. Not just we who are in church on Sunday morning, but everybody who is out there in the world maybe doing some things wrong. Maybe doing some major things wrong. Maybe like that woman taken in the act of adultery. Maybe doing some major you know, sinning out there. Does that include them? Does this include the world doing all kinds of bad and depraved things? Yes, it does. God looking at that whole big mess and saying, I will reconcile all of this to Myself. How will He do it? Not imputing their trespasses to them. Well, who, who did they get imputed to? Jesus. Uh, Anton, would you give me the uh, Amplified? You thought I was going to say message. Uh, amplified. I like the Amplified translation. It was God personally present in Christ, 
reconciling, I like this part, and restoring to favor, restoring the world to favor with Himself. Wow. Restoring the world to favor with Himself. We would think that to be in God's favor would mean we'd have to do some pretty holy living. Get rid of the neckties. <laughs> Uh, restoring, but no, he didn't wait for us to to do all those things we think, you know, all the getting rid of the neckties and you know, I know some legitimate things too. He didn't wait. He didn't wait for us to do it. He did it for us, restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. Isn't that nice? Not counting up. You know, most people think that is God's main job. They picture God with a long white beard and He's up in heaven with a feather quill pen because He hadn't got modern technology. He's got a quill pen. He dips it in the ink. Aha, I caught you. I saw you do that. You thought you got by me. I'm going to write it down on this big scroll. And He's got a big scroll and a feather quill pen. Now you're laughing because that's, that's kind of how people think, isn't it? It says no. He says not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. Now look at the next part. And committing unto us the message of reconciliation. The restoration to favor. Now, if you ask me, you know, I don't. Who am I to say God made a mistake? This is where He dropped the ball <laughs> by committing it to us because us hadn't done it very well. I don't mean us, you and me personally, but you know, I'm speaking of the church world as a whole. This is, by and large, not the message that the church. This is not the message people think they're going to hear when they go to church. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12. Well, counting me, there's 12 of us sitting here. Did you know, percentage-wise, if, you know, if I just sort of uh, make this application, there probably are more people not in church than are in church right now today on Sunday morning. Why? Here's why. People feel guilty and they're afraid if they go to church, they're going to run into God because they know He hangs out there. And they don't want to run into God because they're afraid. You know, listen, think seriously with me. People think if they run into God, they're liable to get what's coming to them. Why do they think that? You know what I heard one person say is, I don't go to church because I went once. <laughs> I really did hear that. <laughs> I don't go to church because I went once. <laughs> People, where did they get that idea that they're going to get what's coming to them from God? Well, they might have heard it from church. You know, it's like I heard another, I'm going to tell you all the things I've heard this morning. Uh, you know, back in Genesis, where after Adam sinned, and, uh, and he went and hid from God. God came down in the cool of the day to walk with him. And, and God said, Adam, where are you? And he said, well, I hid myself because I was naked and I was ashamed. So I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? And what I heard one person say was, I heard it at church. <laughs> yeah. I went to church and they told me. Well, basically that has been the message of the church, but that's not the correct message. This says, if I'm reading this right, the message that God has committed to us is, not the message of you better get straight and fly right, but the message of reconciliation and the restoration to favor. And according to what I've just read, the message is that He's already done it. That He's already restored. You know, what, what would it do if, if a person really did believe that God's already restored me to favor with Himself? Well, what, what do I do about it? Well, look at the next verse. You can go back to King James now, Anton. Look at the next verse. It explains uh, what, we're, what we do. It, it, now we, then we are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, we're representing Him, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now, this is after the message of God's already reconciled Himself to you. And again, this is something that you know people are good about saying you need to get right with God. Well, it's not fair to say to someone you need to get right with God unless you first say God's already got right with you. So what are you waiting for? That's basically what he's saying. Yeah, and just so you just so that you get the picture, just so that Paul makes it absolutely plain. Look at the next verse. He he puts this in just so we make no mistake about what he's trying to say. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made Jesus. God made Jesus to be sin. This is really strong language. It doesn't even just say that he in a kind of an abstract way, uh, went through the motions and carried our sin, like let's just say like you might pick up a handbag, or like you might pick up the garbage, this, this, and hold it like that, and take it out to the truck. It's not that He picked it up and carried it, it's that He made Him to be. Made Him to be sin. Now I think, now some people don't like that and, and disagree with that, but I think it's vital to see it that way. That God made Him to be sin so that the other side of the coin can also be true. He made me to be righteous. 
Not that I've got righteousness tangentially attached to me in an abstract way. He made me to be that. He, you know, on the cross, Jesus exchanged my life for His. And we were talking about a marriage a while ago. We were talking about, remember that? We were talking about a marriage. And we said, how does a person get united to Christ? We come to Him. But that's not where the ceremony started. The ceremony started 2,000 years ago on the cross where He got married to us. He came into union. He did His part 2,000 years ago when He married a bunch of sinners. <laughs> he married... You know, the way Martin Luther explained it, you know, I told you that story. What if a prince went down into the town and got a peasant and married her? The way Martin Luther told it was, he said what Jesus basically did, He's the son of the king. What if He went down into the town and found the worst woman of the town? Like that woman taken in adultery. A woman who's guilty. Uh, who's done a lot of bad things and married her. Now that would cause a lot of people to talk. <laughs> they still talk. But that's what He did. On the cross, He came into union with us so that we, when we came along 2,000 years later, found out about it, we could come into that union with Him. But He already started the ceremony 2,000 years ago by coming into uh, union with us. So now we're in union with Him. You know, the way it works is when a person gets married, uh, everything, uh, you know, man and woman get married, everything of His becomes hers and everything of hers becomes His. He took what was ours, which was all of our sin and all of our disqualifications and all of our faults and all of our flaws and all of our blemishes and everything that was wrong with us. That's what He took from us. What do we take in exchange from Him? Everything that He had. Perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect right standing with God, God's favor. You know, that's why it says we're restored to favor because we stand in His favor. Well, I think that's all I want to say today. Let's all stand up. Jesus! Give my